When you hear about the shepherds that receive the news of Christ's birth, what does it cause you to think of? Is it Linus's speech from the Charlie Brown Christmas? Or have you ever given it more thought than that? And what about the Magi? What do we know about them? Today's guest has spent years studying and writing books about the infancy narratives of Christ's birth. And we discuss what we know for certain about these figures of the gospel, and more importantly, how deepening our understanding can better our lives by bringing us closer to Christ, our Blessed Mother, St. Joseph, the angels, and the saints. Stay with us. Welcome to another episode of the Catholic Gentleman Podcast. We are your co-hosts, Sam Guzman and John Heinen. Uh, and today we are joined uh, by a guest whose name might be familiar to a lot of you uh, due to his many books and evangelical evangelical efforts for, uh, on behalf of uh, the Catholic faith. Uh, that's Father Dwight Longnecker. Uh, just a brief introduction to the, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with him. He was brought up in an evangelical home in Pennsylvania. He uh, went off to college at Bob Jones University, where he got a degree in speech and English, and then he went on from there to study theology at Oxford University, um, and eventually uh, became an uh, an Anglican priest, was ordained as an Anglican priest, uh, and was a chaplain at Cambridge University, uh, and also spent some time uh, as a parson on the Isle of Wight. Uh, which is all very um, uh, beautiful and picturesque. But eventually, Father Longnecker came to realize uh, that he was on a different path and and the Holy Spirit was leading him to the Catholic Church. So in 1995, his family was received into the Catholic Church uh, and his uh, was received, uh, his ordination was uh, became an Anglican, or I mean, not an Anglican, a Catholic he became a Catholic priest, um, and uh, he is now a writer and a priest of a parish in uh, South Carolina that's booming um, with the growing school and having to add masses all the time because they're growing so quickly. And he's written many, many, many books uh, over the last few years uh, on a variety of fascinating topics. Um, but he now serves as pastor primarily of Our Lady of the Rosary Church in Greenville, South Carolina. So all the way back home to South Carolina, where he started off at Bob Jones University. I'm also uh, a graduate of Bob Jones. Uh, so we have some interesting connection there. I was also considering the Anglican priesthood, but uh, was called to the Catholic Church before I went down that path. Thanks be to God. Um, but um, a lot of uh, overlap in our histories there, Father Longnecker. But uh, so glad to have you with us. Glad to be here. Sorry, Sam, I'd forgotten that you were a Bob Jones graduate as well. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and I, I am grateful for that. New so. I'm going to start a new organization called Bob Jones Catholics. You want to join? <laughs> <Yeah. me? laughs> we should. There'd probably be a lot of uh, members of that. Yeah, so so we're really here uh, to though we're kind of here in the season of Advent, uh, the third week of Advent, as as we record this, um, and and we're really looking towards. Uh, one of my favorite times of year, uh, the um, wonderful holiday uh, of Christmas, the feast of, of our Lord's birth. Um, and we really want to talk, though, about the historical characters that show up in the gospel narratives, uh, these shepherds, uh, and as well as the Magi. And you've written books on both of these um, in, uh, sets of individuals. Um, and uh, a lot of people might just kind of laugh at that and say, well, of course, these narratives aren't meant to be taken literally. And of course, Jesus wasn't really born on December 25th or any of these things. These are all just kind of mythology. that's kind of grown up around uh, this person, Jesus. But but really, we can't take these things seriously. But but you've done a lot of research on this. Uh, and have written a couple of books uh, that kind of dive deeply into the historicity of these characters. So that's uh, really what we'd like to dive into today. But before we get into that, I'm just curious, like, what got you interested in this topic specifically? I mean, there's a lot of different things that you've written about. Uh, what 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 kind of uh, sparked a curiosity to 
study these topics more deeply? Well, it all started when I was asked. I was asked to write an article some years ago for, I think it was our Sunday visitor, one of the Catholic papers on who were the Magi. So I began researching this, and of course, if, as soon as you begin researching that, it takes you to Persia, uh, and it says that they were Persian um, soothsayers or per- Persian mm. uh, uh, wise men, uh, and. I wondered whether this was there was anything to back it up. But, but when I dug down to another level, I found that there was that was probably not the case. So I then went and looked in the Old Testament and the prophecies of the wise men in the Old Testament in Isaiah and Psalms say that they will come from Sheba and Seba uh, uh, and from Midian and so forth. And I said, well, where were those places? And those locations in the time of Jesus uh, were in the kingdom of the Nabataeans, which is basically uh, west, Western and Northwestern Arabia. And so that led me to the further research of my book, The Mystery of the Magi. Hmm. I then began to dig a bit further and say, well, you know, one of the commonplaces in modern biblical scholarship is that the story of the Magi is not historical. In fact, when I began to ask some New Testament scholars, they said, oh, yeah, they just said, you know, if you suggest that the Magi are historical, you'll be laughed out of the academic mm. common room. You know, it's like, of course they weren't historical. Following a magical star across the desert sands, no, this is a total fairy tale. Mm. Um, and should you try to suppose that they're even historical at all or even have, have a foundation in history, um, it'll be like, you know, get out of here. Go, go teach Sunday school somewhere in Montana. Uh, with no offense to people who live in Montana. But, um, <laughs> you know, so I said, well, what if we dig about dig in a bit further and see if there is a histor- at least a historical foundation to the story uh, and see um, why they would appear in the Gospels at all? So that led me to the research on the, on the Magi. And then I thought there was room to do some similar work on the shepherds. And it proved to be the case. Yeah, no, I think that's exciting. And I do think for our listeners, it'll be helpful for us to talk about uh, different ways of understanding or different senses, as it says in the the catechism of understanding scripture, because and then I would like to talk to you, somebody more experienced. I, I only get the whisperings and I'm not a scripture scholar myself, but, you know, of the historical critical method, because I know I would assume you'd be accused of that. And um, and in which case that aligns you to a certain thought process and and but when i've read your books that's not the case at all but let's let's take a step back and just talk about you know interpretation of scripture and the different ways that that scripture can be interpreted something that i know that you're you're keen on and bringing up in your books yeah we we have to put this in historical context and really take it right back to the turn of the 19th to the 20th century at this time in Europe, there were various philosophical trends that were going on and, and academic trends that were going on, which were actually very interesting. Um, the sciences of anthropology and archaeology were beginning to be discovered and developed. Uh, the study of mythology and primitive cultures was being d- discovered. The interaction of primitive religions with mythology. All of this was beginning to, to blossom with the work of Sir James Fraser um, and mm. other um, noted scholars. And This was coming at the back end, of course, of the Enlightenment, where some of the Enlightenment biblical scholars had begun to question what I call the Sunday school understanding of Scripture, which is everything in the Bible is true because it's God's Word, and therefore everything is absolutely historically and scientifically true also. You know, and that's sort of absurd approach is summarized by the, I think, 16th or 17th century English um, uh, Irish archbishop, who calculated the date back to the day of creation and said it happened on six, you know, January fourth, sixty two, six thousand and six BC or something like that. Yes, That's yes. Morning, you know, uh, and um, so they were reacting against that sort of very fundamentalist, basic Sunday school understanding of scripture and began to doubt the historicity of the of the Bible. And of course, it doesn't take you very. Uh, very much imagination to begin to read stories like Jonah and the whale and other stories like that from the Old Testament and say, well, did this really happen? You know, and those questions are okay. It's okay to ask those questions. But the result of this questioning attitude was also loaded with the enlightenment mentality of um, extreme doubt about the existence of God at all and the the Christian faith. And they began to undermine the historical um, reliability of first the Old Testament, and then also the New Testament. And as the study of mythology developed and and primitive religions, the biblical scholar said, aha, look, 
Now we understand how these stories developed. They un, they developed within this primitive religious setting where the people told stories and then they elaborated the stories like Chinese whispers and then they added more stuff and they wanted to be Jesus to be even more fantastical so they added these fantastic fabulous stories of miracles and other stuff. But we can strip all that away now. Um and that's was of course Rudolf Bultmann and demoth, demythologize it. I can't say it, demythologization. Hmm. Strip away all the supernatural elements, and then you see what you have left. Well, uh, this undermined the historical reliability of the Bible for many scholars, and especially the Christmas story was perceived as being um, mythological or supernatural or just a made-up fairy tale. And let's admit it, when we read the Christmas story, there's lots of... um, kind of fairy tale elements you know angels appear to three or four of the characters people have magical dreams where angels talk to them there's wizards from a faraway land who come like dumbledore and merlin <laughs> and Gandalf, you know following a magical <clears throat> star uh and and coming to, to visit this magical child who's born there's a mother and a baby and a panicked father. There's, you know, lovely animals. There's an ox and a cozy, a dozy little donkey and some lovely little lambkins. The sentimentality and the um, fairy tale elements of the story are very powerful in the story itself. So therefore, the nativity um, stories, more than any other in the gospel, have lent themselves to this, um, what I call, elaboration of the story, where over the centuries, for lots of different reasons, which I outline in my book, um, various things were added to the stories, which have become part of our sort of 21st century Christmas story. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we accept these things as part of the tradition. But in fact, when we read Matthew and Luke's gospel, a lot of the things just aren't there. So I've been accused of being a Grinch and a party pooper for stripping some (laughs) of these things away. (laughs) I've said, no, no, you can keep all those, but just remember that they're not part of the original story. Let's go and look at the original story because it'll help you to understand the reality of Jesus being born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Yeah, and I think it's such an important point because, you know, fundamentalism, well-intentioned as it is, is often focused on defending the accuracy of the Bible, and yet it, it's in, uh, un, unintentionally buying into the modern, very modern mindset that only what is literally or scientifically verifiable is true. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's it's kind of taking the secular terms as the, the terms of, uh, uh, oh yeah, the scientific mindset actually is the only way to verify truth. Um, and and buying into that that presupposition, if you will, uh, and then trying to squeeze the supernatural narratives of the Bible into that scientifically verifiable and universally repeatable framework that that uh, science that. says is the only way to the truth. Yeah, I, um, appreciate, I appreciate that, but um, the his, the history really matters. But the Catholic approach is to say the history matters. But the supernatural is infused up through the history, which is yes. the mystery of the incarnation, that our Lord takes human flesh and steps into human history. So the history matters, but also the supernatural meaning is also important. Yes, yeah. And and I love that, that nuance that our faith provides because it kind of solves that dilemma of like, at least there has to be, we have to either find the literal Noah's Ark or it's it's a worthless story, you know, like, or, yeah. or you know, it's complete mythology with no basis in, in history. And then it's like, we can have, you know, the Catholic way often is both and. Um, but I, I'm wondering too, you know, the, these, these characters, I mean, they're, they're, they're fascinating because they're so different. Um, the, 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 the shepherds are like the poorest of the poor, completely unknown, unrespected in society. And then on the other hand, you have these you know, wealthy, like semi-mystical figures of the Magi and and uh, coming from a far distant land and a completely different culture and not Jewish at all. And, 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 and they're both coming together. Um, take us inside a little bit of like what these worlds were actually like, like, uh, for, you know, the, these characters, like what, what was it like to be a, you know, a first century shepherd, uh, in Israel? Uh, and well, likewise, uh, you know, uh, what was the Magi? What, what, what did they do? You know, uh, what was their, what was their way of life? 
Um, how, long, how long have we got? <laughs> yeah. Because that's a big topic. Uh, to understand the shepherds in 2,000 years ago, actually, we can be very enlightened by studying the Bedouin culture, which is still in existence today. Mm. The Bedouin are a series of a uh, collection of Arabian tribes, basically, whose history goes back 7,000 years, right back into Old Testament times. These are nomadic and semi-nomadic um, uh, herdsmen who are shepherds. Even today, when you go to the, to the Middle East today, you'll see the, the Bedouin tents and the Bedouin encampments uh, with their flocks, even today. And one of the most interesting books I um, researched when I was looking doing this, this book was by a Jewish scholar who lives in Israel and has spent decades living and studying the Bedouin culture. And one of the most interesting books that he produced was tracking details in the Old Testament to contemporary Bedouin culture. Little things like um, the Bedouin tent will have an outer covering of black goat's hair. Hmm. And then he tracks down uh, a detail in the Old Testament where the tabernacle in the Old Testament was stipulated to be covered with, with black goat's hair. And he explains that black goat's hair is more um, waterproof and water resistant than anything else. But anyway, he makes these little cultural connections between a whole range of Bedouin customs today and the Bedouin lifestyle today and the and the um, herdsman uh, uh, shepherd culture of father, even back to Father Abraham and Moses and the, and the Hebrews in the desert. So the Jewish shepherd culture, which would have been contemporary to our Lord's birth in Bethlehem, would basically be very similar, if not exactly similar, to the Bedouin culture, which existed thousands of years before, and the Bedouin culture, which you can still trace in the Holy Land today. Now, the reason I say that it would have been virtually the same is because this scholar, Clinton Bailey, shows that the Bedouin are an extremely traditional people. They follow their customs and their cultural customs and their traditions to the letter um, very strictly, and they've maintained this thousands-of-year-old culture because of that. And so when he traces details in modern Bedouin culture back to the Old Testament, we can be sure that those same traits would have existed in the time of Jesus, and we know from the other cultural evidence that the shepherds in Bethlehem were kind of like the descendants or uh, one of the tribes, which could be very basically and, and generally be classified as Bedouin. Mm. No, I think that's really fascinating. So, um, so why why did they get this great privilege? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about their witness, right? Why why was it that the angels? Why did Luke think that this was so important to bring and mention in the? Um, in the scriptures and how do we or i'd love to just learn from you you know kind of the accuracy uh, of that narrative of the shepherds well the shepherds i th i believe were actually uh, not unusual we know that there were lots of shepherds in that area and that particular um neighborhood five miles five or six miles uh, outside jerusalem there in bethlehem was known especially for its flocks and for its um uh, for shepherd families of course it's the city of david david was a shepherd in those same in those same hills uh a thousand years earlier so i believe that the message was given to the sh shepherds simply because they were the local population they were the ones who were right mm -hmm. there on the spot um and they were the ones that god wanted to say go and check this out and that when they went to the um, stable to find the Christ child, they would have been vis visiting the home of one of their neighbors um, in, in that same town, probably a shepherd family or an agricultural family themselves. Mm. So if you like, God is saying, you know, Emmanuel is God is with us. The Jews are a shepherd people in the city of David. And the Lord is saying, here is the Son of God coming to the ordinary people who are in the city of David. Um, to fulfill his kingdom on earth. Yeah. There's another and, interesting there's another interesting detail which I discovered, and that is that um in the Mishnah, which is a collection of Jewish rubrics and rules for life, um, there's a detail which says that the animals between Jerusalem and Bethlehem are to be devoted to the temple sacrifices. So many scholars believe that the Bethlehem shepherds were actually sacred shepherds. 
Mm. And that they were raising the sheep and the lambs, which which would be used in the temple in Jerusalem for sacrifice. And we know from Josephus and some of the other um, historical records that the temple in Jerusalem, the priests there would have con- would have consumed in their daily sacrifices and the annual sacrifices tens of thousands of sheep and goats and lambs. So where did they all come from? They had to come from somewhere. From somewhere. And the scholars believe that they were they were actually being raised there um, in the hills of Bethlehem. Hmm. So if you like, they were the Lord came not only to the shepherds of Bethlehem, he came to the lambs of God in Bethlehem. The Lamb of Amen. God to the Lambs of God. Wow, that's 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 incredible. Um so 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 historical details can not only uh cast doubt on biblical narratives, they can also enhance biblical narratives. Uh, go, go um so I so do you, you know? Do you think this is a historically accurate account? I mean, do you think the the shepherds were there on the night Christ was born, and they came to them as as the gospel narrative says? Like, do you think there's historical evidence that that was what actually happened? Well, of course, we don't have a um, news reporter on this on the scene mm-hmm. at the time, but what we can put together are little little bits and pieces, and that is that we know that the the nomadic and semi-nomadic lifestyle of shepherds in the Middle East, and certainly in the Hebron Valley, is one in which they would spend a lot of time outdoors and a lot of time camping out with their with their flock and tending their flock outdoors. So we know that re- that is a reality, which is true even today. We find the shepherds still wandering across those hills with their flocks, living in caves, living in shelters, uh, temporary shelters to be with their flocks um, right through the night. Um, there's some other details also which have emerged. You know, some scholars said, well, Jesus couldn't have been born in December because sheep give give birth in the spring. Therefore, um, he must have been born in, in April or May. Hmm. But the Awasi breed of sheep are the sheep native to the Middle East, a very ancient breed of sheep. And they actually give birth, you guessed it, between November and January. Huh. How fascinating. No, I appreciate that. Well, and in that line of what uh, um, Sam was talking about and one of the initial reasons we reasons we reached out to you is because here we are in Advent time in preparation for Christmas. Um, I'd like to talk briefly or spend some time talking about the Magi uh, that you spent such a a long time writing about in in that original book uh, a few years ago that I I picked up and um, and as so many things with me, it's like I've never I I accepted the Sunday school, you know, teachings of it. I I made that humor, humorous comment in the teaser about uh, Charlie Brown's Christmas. And we kind of leave it, leave it at that, you know, and I like the St. Andrew's Novena where we're like at midnight in Bethlehem and piercing cold. Right. It really brings that sort of uh, reality to to our lives that we can relate to. Um, But It wasn't until your book that I really started questioning a lot of these things and realizing, huh, you know, uh, what am I supposed to be uh, gathering from these men? What am I supposed to be pulling up, um, you know, other than gold, frankincense and myrrh and the symbolism in that and, you know, uh, these sort of things. So I'd love for you to talk about uh, uh, some of the things you've discovered and uncovered when you were uh, preparing and and learning about uh, uh, the Magi and, and, and sifting truth or historical truth from uh say spiritual uh understandings and sense and these i think you call them decorations that were added and i'd love for you to spend some time chatting about that yeah um the <clears throat> elaborations of the magi story begin really in the second and third century uh and in the book i go into much more detail about it but basically um Christianity at this point is being influenced by uh manichaeism and by gnosticism from the east mm. basically Persia and the Eastern religions. And these, the Gnostic religions are very fascinated with magic and with um, secret spells and secret knowledge and all that sort of thing. So the Magi were the, kind of like, they're heroes. They, they love the Magi. And the word magic comes from Magi, okay? Mm. So they like the whole magic, mystical side of the whole thing. And various apocryphal gospels began to be written right up through to the 4th, 5th, and 6th century about the Magi, with all sorts of fantastical tales about how um, they saw uh, a baby gleaming in the sky, and that is the star which led them step by step and provided miracles all across this long desert journey and so forth. And a lot of these uh, apocryphal stories drifted into the Western tradition when we were um, 
not quite so scrupulous about the canon of scripture and we were taking these myth these ancient they were already ancient stories by the middle ages as part of the story so they became part of our story as well the names the fact that there were three um named balthazar melchior and caspar this comes from persia in the sixth century okay and wow. it comes into the western tradition because of the mosaics which are in the church of uh, saint apollinari in class say in ravenna um, established by the Emperor Justinian. There are the three kings wearing Persian uh, outfits with the names underneath them. So this then sort of came in lock, stock, and barrel into our Western tradition. It's not in the Bible, okay? Yeah. Um, and, and these various decorations and lots more than that became part of our tradition, part of our customs. And I wanted to actually value them, but also go back and say, well, but what might it have really been like? And which has led me to the Nabataeans and to my research in the book. Yeah. And and if you could, you just that last bit that you were talking about valuing them. Um, can we talk a, about that? Because I know that a lot of our listeners, uh, when when they just start hearing this, this is a kind of a Cliff Notes version. So we encourage everybody to get the books. Um, but uh, but in this Cliff Notes version, they might start thinking, OK, well, then we we can't trust them. You know, uh, we we can't trust. I mean, I know myself hearing the, uh, you know, We Three Kings uh, Christmas Carol and hearing Mario Lanza's version where he named each of those uh um uh magi and thinking oh we do have the names of them you know and in my you know immaturity in my youth but we don't want to cast uh um too much doubt or doubt on on the importance of these you know uh decorations and these um elements but could you talk a little bit about that of how we can still value that tradition but also how it's not bad to to move it aside to get to a deeper truth and a deeper underlying underlying understanding with our with our knowledge these days if that makes sense one of the the analogies i love to use is the analogy of king arthur okay okay you go to, if you go to England, you can actually find a a hill a, a mound with the ruins of a hill fort from the um roughly roughly from the Roman Celtic Romano Celtic time period, and archaeologists and scholars believe that this might actually be the original site of Camelot, and that there was a real King Arthur in Romano Celtic Britain who was a chieftain who led the British and so forth, but out of that historical foundation comes. The medieval poem about of of King Arthur by Mallory, and then in the nineteenth century, another one uh, by Tennyson, and then there's um, the Once and Future King by T. H. White, which was turned into a Disney film, and there's Camelot the musical, and there's Merlin the TV show, and all this other all these other spinoffs that come from the original story. Well, there was a foundation of history to it. And we love all those spin-offs because they help us to think about King Arthur and the romantic tales of the Knights of the Round Table, which is all well and good. But when you actually go and discover the historical Arthur, it's very different. And that should actually shed more light on the, the, the spin-offs, if you like. So same thing with the Magi. I believe there's a real solid historical foundation for the story and that the Gospels are actually are our best access to that historical foundation because they're the ones that's the stories closest to the time period. The other spin-offs for the last 2000 years and these spin-offs were not just from the 3rd and 4th century. We have stories like The Fourth Wise Man and um Follow the Star. We have bumper stickers Wise Men Still 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 Follow the Star. <laughs> okay, all sorts of um wonderful spin-offs from the story but they are um the spin-offs they're not the story itself. And it's fine to question those spin-offs. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, for instance, in the book, I pointed out that if they were from Arabia and they were noblemen and they were wealthy, they probably rode Arabian horses. They didn't ride camels Mm. Mm. because that's what a wealthy Arabian would have traveled on. They would have used camels for pack horses, perhaps. Okay. Uh, the Arabian horse was the Cadillac and the pack horse was the pickup truck. Okay. They would have rode Cadillac. So, um, but then one of my friends said, do you mean I can't have camels in my nativity set? I said, no, you can have camels. In your nativity set. <laughs> but I just realized that the real wise men probably do not ride camels. That's all. Mm, thank you. No, I appreciate that. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's fascinating. I uh, am curious, too. Uh, do you, do, did you go into this in your book? Like, Where did the tradition of the names come from, the three names? The th- well, first of all, the idea that there were three comes from the three gifts 
there were three gifts. There must have been three kings. Um, and all of the history, when you look at it, over the first sort of five or six centuries, there were various um, Magi stories developed all around the ancient Middle East. There's an Ethiopian version. There's an Egyptian Coptic version. Uh, there's a Syrian version. There's a Persian version. There's an Armenian version. And all of these different versions from the early churches had their own extra stories about the Magi. And they all had different names for them. And sometimes there were 12 magi, sometimes there were six, sometimes there's three, sometimes there's four. It all all the different stories, all those extra stories actually are actually varied. Matthew doesn't give us the number, and he certainly doesn't give us their names. That's so it's an extra biblical tradition. I was just um curious if there's some significance to that. But but I, I guess I'm wondering too, um you know, the historicity aside, like uh uh what are some you know what what is the significance of these being uh you know spiritually present for us you know in 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 the canon of scripture that we have you know it's um you know we have we we believe that that the scripture is uh inspired um so it, it made it in there somehow like what 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 can we take away for or what can we learn, I guess, spiritually speaking, from well, we the presence can, we can of the Magi? Why Matthew included the Magi story in his gospel account. And I believe Matthew was writing at a time when we know the church was going through uh a controversy over the the um Judaizing Christians, the Christians who were saying that Jesus was only for the Jews, not for the Gentiles. You know, this conflict comes up in the book of Galatians and elsewhere in Paul's um, uh, epistles. And we know that the early church had this conflict between uh, Jew and Gentile. Was the Christianity only for the Jews? And I believe Matthew puts the Magi in the gospel story to take the side of the Gentiles, to say, look, even at our Lord's nativity, the Gentiles were, 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 um, uh, called to the to the to worship the Lord, even though they're coming from a non-Jewish background. So the old preaching point of uh, of Epiphany being the gospel going out to all the world is actually one of the valid ones from the gospel itself. Yeah, oh, excellent. Um, I wanted to talk also. Uh, you do a great job discussing uh, how the Holy Spirit inspired these writers because. Luke was writing 50 60 years you know after the fact do you do you think he would have met the shepherds or do you think um how was he inspired and what are some of the church's understanding of the holy spirit's inspiration sam's comment on the holy spirit inspiration uh triggered that and i know that that comes up in your book and i'd love for you to chat about that yeah, and the book's called The Secret of the Bethlehem Shepherds because this is really what I think is one of the most important things about the shepherds for us today, and that is that we can understand the method of oral uh, tradition and oral transmission mm. of story. And this came out of the book I mentioned by Clinton Bailey, the guy who worked with the Bedouins, and another guy named Bailey, named Kenneth Bailey, a Protestant minister who ministered in Palestine for decades and understood the Palestinian people and understood um, the current day methods of communication. And both of them track uh, three different layers of community um, uh, communications. And remember, this is in a community which certainly in Old Testament and New Testament times, the majority of people were illiterate. So mm. we have to ask, how they pass their stories on? They had three different levels. One was road memorization in which you had to memorize particular events which had happened in the past and especially important there was poetry and genealogies you had to memorize the poetry and the genealogies and as you would recite it the elders in the community would correct you if you got it wrong okay mm. so there was specific rote memorization and on the other extreme was uh, basic anecdotal storytelling. You know, when we all tell a story, that, you know, I went shopping last week, you'll never believe what happened, okay? And we tell a story like that. And that story could be passed on, but of course, as it's passed on, it's open to to interpretation, it's open to exaggeration, it's open to um, elaboration by the next generation of storyteller. And then they said there's one in the middle, and this is typical of Palestinian peoples today and also um, the Bedouin culture, which Clinton Bailey studied. And the one in the middle was called um, informal controlled, in which someone would tell a story 
and they were allowed to take a certain amount of leeway for characterization or dialogue, but the basics of the story still had to be memorized and had to be factual. And so I believe that the uh, shepherds in their Bedouin culture, Bedouin type culture in Bethlehem, passed the stories on to the next generation in the same way. And we actually find that in Luke's gospel because there's a genealogy there. There's mm-hmm. elements of poetry there with the angel message coming and singing this song, which was, which was recorded poetically. But also, we find a little bit of characterization in dialogue where one of the shepherds says, Come, let us go into the village and see this thing which the Lord has revealed to us. Okay, so there's a little bit of human contact there and and and, and charming sort of uh, characterization and dialogue, if you like. Uh, and so this is being shown there in Luke's gospel. And also Luke also says they went and told everyone about what had happened. So yeah. he's actually saying they were the ones who passed this story on. Now, remember, as you said, Luke is talking to them about 50 or 60 years later. So this, um, I, I believe they're talking, he was talking to the early Christian community in Bethlehem, some of whom were the descendants of the shepherds. Yeah, well, no, and I love that. And it was because of your writings that that I, in reading the infancy narrative again, and just bringing this up in the second chapter of Luke, where at the very end there, it says, and the shepherds returning, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And uh, and I was just like, gosh, you know, never connected these lines and these, di- you know, in that tradition, I, you bring so much sense to it. And, and I really appreciate that. So... Well, it opened my eyes too when I read that and began to put the pieces together. So yeah, and and the chapter before that, of course, Saint Luke says these are the things which eyewitnesses have seen. Yeah. Okay, and so he's actually relating. He must have done some research and visit. I believe visited with this, the 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 children or the grandchildren of the shepherds themselves. Very great. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's that's really incredible. So in, uh, a lot of rich um, content in these books. Um, uh, what is your hope and uh, people take away as they as they read these uh, and and really come to know the more the his, historical details of uh, of these characters? You know, I researched this book on a two month sabbatical out in Jerusalem, and was lucky to spend a couple of take a took of to take a couple of day trips over to Bethlehem and explore the the Hebron Valley uh, with wow. a guide. And when you're there, what is so impressive is you really come away and say, you know, I learned all these stories from the Bible. It happened. This is where it is. You go into the church of the Holy Sepulcher, and it is most certainly the place where Jesus was crucified, where he was buried, where he rose again. I celebrated uh, Mass on the third Sunday of Easter, actually in the edicule, in the empty tomb of our Lord. I mean, it was just mind-blowing. And when you go to Bethlehem, uh, when you study the history of the background of the Church of the Holy Nativity in Bethlehem, you are almost certainly standing and venerating the very spot where our Lord was born. The history of it is undeniable. So it's 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 really exciting. And say, the incarnation of our Lord is not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. These events took place here in this place. Jesus said, uh, "If if I were quiet, the rocks and stones would shout out. Well, when you're there, the rocks and stones do shout out." Wow. Ah, that's so wonderful. Oh, I appreciate that. So um, I guess my final question uh, yeah, here, yeah, please. By the way, I'll give you a little push right now for um, a pilgrimage I'm doing with Steve Ray in May of 2024. If any of your listeners want to sign up, they can find new information about that on my blog. Wonderful. And actually, that was uh, just my last two questions is, one, where would you like in, uh, to send men to um, to to take a look at your books, to grab your books, pick them up? And then my second question is this episode launching in the Advent season here in 2022, right before Christmas, what's a final message that you would like to leave men with as that being the predominant listening uh, audience that we have before us? I think to take this message back and to say our Lord's incarnation at Bethlehem was a historical fact, the fact which changed history, the fact in which all of the turning point of all of history, let it be a turning point of the history of my life as well. Um, By all means, enjoy all the frippery and the fancy stuff of Christmas, but cut through it and actually make sure that you um, worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness and connect with him uh, in a real historical way in your life. 
Thank you. Yeah, so much. And where would you like men to go to pick up your books? Where where can they easily access my them? My website's dwightlongnecker.com. They can go there to read my books. Um read my blog posts every day. Um connect with some of my video and audio courses. Come on over to dwightlongnecker.com. Terrific. Well, we'll put that in the show notes. Um so Sam, I don't want to cut you off though. Any last questions for you? No, no, I, I just want to end on a, I guess, a, we've talked a lot about history, but just a, to, to, you are a preacher, so, you know, bring it back, back around to the spiritual in the sense that, how can, how can learning about these characters help us prepare for uh, our, our Lord's nativity? Spiritual how spirit. can, say that again, what was the question? I, I, how can, how can, how can, how can these characters help us prepare for our, our Lord's nativity, spiritually speaking, as we kind of make our journey through Advent? Well, you know, although some of the preachers over the centuries have added some of the decoration I'm talking about, in fact, mm -hmm. a lot of the preaching points are very valid and are very real and very vivid. And one of those is the contrast between the shepherds and the magi. Typically, they, they're portrayed as the peasants and the kings, the ordinary people and the intelligentsia, the elite and the ordinary folks. And that's still a good message for today, that our Lord comes to the a uh, whole range of hum humanity from the very bottom socially to the very top socially to the educated to the non-educated and, and to all of us. Amen. Wow. Well, Father, thank you so very much for joining us on today's episode. So timely uh, during this Advent season. Um, we just really appreciate you being here and, you know, encourage all our listeners to offer up a prayer for you and, and please keep the Catholic gentleman in your prayers. Good. Thank you very much. Good to be with you today. Awesome. And as we end each of our episodes, be a man, be a saint. <laughs>